<clears throat> in 2012, my AFRL team and I deployed to Afghanistan. Just one week after we arrived, our base was attacked. Sixteen Taliban members dressed in stolen U.S. Army uniforms infiltrated the fence line. My team and I watched as the flight line erupted with explosions that rocked the ground. Taliban members targeted aircraft and fuel dumps with rocket-propelled grenades and machine gun fire. The attack and the ensuing firefight lasted hours. Most of the attackers were killed. Many were killed by helicopters that took off from the base and attacked right where they had taken off from, inside the base. After the attackers were killed or captured, the extent of the damage was evident. Nine aircraft, including all six Marine Harriers stationed there, were destroyed. Two Marines were also dead. It was described as the worst loss of U.S. air power in a single incident since the Vietnam War. This was our introduction to Afghanistan, and it got worse from here. Let me tell you the story of how we got there. The story starts with me as an AFRL civilian program manager and technical lead developing a high-power microwave system for neutralizing improvised explosive devices, or IEDs. These roadside bombs have killed more troops, U.S. troops, in Iraq and Afghanistan than anything else. I spent seven years leading a team to develop a prototype system for use on the battlefield. After successfully testing this system, we were asked to deploy it to Afghanistan. I transitioned from AFRL civilian Dr. Jeff to Air Force Reservist Major Jeff to lead the deployment. Here I am in my battle rattle, preparing for a combat mission. The AFRL team consisted of military, civilians, and contractors who built this system, and then several of them deployed with it to Afghanistan. The military operations team consisted of Captain Mike, Sergeant Mike, Sergeant Gill, and myself. So let me tell you a little bit more about this technology. This one-of-a-kind prototype system is a high-power microwave system called Max Power, and it was designed to neutralize IEDs. The high-power microwave group at the Directed Energy Directorate first got the idea to use microwaves to neutralize IEDs back in 2004, when IEDs started to become a substantial threat to U.S. forces in Iraq. After some proof-of-concept experiments, we developed a prototype concept for use with ground forces on the battlefield. The microwave source is housed in the 20-foot armored container on the back of the truck. Inside are two gas turbines, think jet engines, a bunch of complex power electronics, and a high-power microwave transmitter. The antenna then directs the microwaves towards the target. After years in the lab and out at the test range, the system was ready to go to Afghanistan. The military operations team had also spent years, or months, conducting combat training with Marine units. A C-5 aircraft arrived at Kirtland, and we loaded the system and all our stuff onto it. Ironically, as we waited to get onto the aircraft, we gathered in the facility where we had built Max Power with our families. We said our goodbyes and walked from that facility to the aircraft that would take us all the way to Afghanistan. We arrived in Afghanistan at Camp Leatherneck, the main U.S. base in southwest Afghanistan in Helmand Province. It was the main Marine base and was also shared with the British, who called their side of base Camp Bastion. Prince Harry, an Apache helicopter weapons operator, was also stationed there. Now, if Afghanistan is a rough place, Helmand is the worst of it. The Taliban have always had a strong presence there, and 70% of the opium that comes from Afghanistan comes from Helmand. In fact, most of the places that my team and I went to while we were there have already fallen back into Taliban hands. 
After we arrived, we started preparing ourselves and the system for combat operations. The operations team had many responsibilities, including partnering with units, conducting reconnaissance missions with those units, understanding the intelligence data on the threats in the areas, and many other tasks. We initially started conducting operations with marine logistics units, conducting combat logistics patrols to resupply forward operating bases. While these missions were successful, we soon discovered there were more IEDs to be found elsewhere, and we went looking for a fight. In examining the intelligence data, we found the areas with the most IEDs and the units that were running missions there. One such unit was an Army Combat Engineering Company, and they were located with us at Leatherneck. We didn't know where their headquarters were, so we drove around base looking for people in Army uniforms and asking them if they were part of this unit. We quickly found the unit, and after talking with their company commander, we started running missions with them. Now, this is how most missions would go. We would join a patrol near the middle of the convoy. When we got to an area where they, we thought there were IEDs, we would head to the front of the convoy and lead that patrol through those danger areas. Mike or Gil would drive, and I would operate the system. On these missions, we were exposed to many of the dangers of the combat environment, including small arms fire, IED blasts, and snipers. I was personally within 100 meters of five IED blasts. Being out in front of the convoy was a dangerous place to be, and we depended on max power to keep us safe. In the next video, you'll see Gil and I preparing for our first combat mission with max power. We were preparing to go outside the wire, out into danger and combat. The maiden voyage of Max Power. First time we're taking it outside the lines. Anything to say, Gil? Let's get out the wire. Yeah. Probably put this in a documentary somewhere to, in the archives of when I was alive. Nice. Nice. It's been a long time. Finally, he's here. To all the people who said we wouldn't get out the wire, there it is. <laughs> Look at that amazing combat stash I had. <laughs> there were many missions where things went well and we were successful. These were the good days. Nobody got hurt or killed, and we were able to accomplish the mission. Things didn't always go as planned, but we were able to adapt and still get the job done. One such good day was our first mission with 2-7, a marine infantry company. As we headed towards the fence, I was spinning up the system to make sure it was ready for the mission. As I was spinning up the turbine, I lost all communication with the system in back from my control computers in the cab. I told the patrol commander that the system was broken, but I told them that we thought we could probably fix it at our first stop on that mission, a small forward operating base. We left the wire with Gil driving. I started taking the dash apart to try and figure out what was wrong. He started taking stuff apart too. We weren't able to figure out what was wrong, but we soon arrived at the forward operating base. As we pulled in, I noticed a bunch of Marines, all in their combat gear, standing next to their vehicles, waiting for this next mission. As I jumped out of the truck, they were looking at us. These guys have, had heard of us before. We were those crazy Air Force guys that liked being out in front. Now at this point, I had no idea what was wrong with Max Power. Nothing like this had ever broken on it before. I ran into the command post to tell the company commander that the system was broken and that we needed some time to fix it. He told me we had all the time that we needed. They weren't going to run this next mission without us. There were just too many IEDs. I ran back to the system and stripped off my body armor to get to work. We quickly figured out that there was no power going to the system, which was supplied through two very large fuses. I opened up the fuse panel, and there were two spare fuses duct taped to the inside of the panel. I replaced the fuses and spun the system back up. 
The whole repair had only taken about 30 minutes, and the Marines were standing there watching us the whole time. We conducted a hasty pre-mission briefing, and then we went on to hunt IEDs. We went on that day to investigate seven possible IEDs, and the mission was a great success. We had to adapt to the change in plans, but we were able to do so because of the skill and experience of the Max Power team. Had anyone else been out there that day, they would have failed because they just did not know that system like we did because we built it. There were also days when things didn't go as planned and people got hurt or killed. Those were the bad days. One such bad day, we weren't even on a mission, but we were supposed to be. We were supposed to be escorting a Marine combat logistics patrol through an area where we had worked before. Unfortunately, we weren't on mission that day because we were trying to upgrade the system software and we were having procedural issues getting it done. As the convoy moved through the area where we were supposed to be leading, one of their vehicles hit an IED. Chris was the truck commander in the vehicle along with several other Marines. Chris was injured in the blast, and he died a short time later. That night, we went out to the flight line to conduct a dignified transfer. A thousand Marines loaded Chris's body in a flag-draped coffin into the back of a C-130 in absolute silence. A few days later, I went and talked to Chris's platoon commander. As I stood there talking to him, I knew by the look on his face exactly what he was thinking. I was thinking the same thing, too. He was thinking, if you had been here, this never would have happened. He was probably right. That was a pretty bad day. After 19 combat missions in Afghanistan, it was time to come home. But coming home isn't necessarily as easy as it sounds. I had my last combat mission on a Thursday, and it was a pretty rough mission. The next Tuesday, I was getting off a plane to meet my family. While I was absolutely thrilled to be back with them, it was a hard transition, especially in such a short amount of time. To go from the combat environment where you are just trying to survive the next mission to being back in the comfort and safety of the United States was overwhelming. It was also difficult to interact with people who have never experienced the combat environment. AFRL coworkers, other military members who have never experienced combat, even friends and family. Some wanted to ignore my deployment completely. Others wanted to know every detail, including things that I did not want to talk about. Most seemed to just not care. There are two things that got me through my time in Afghanistan, and these two things still help me cope with those experiences today. My faith in God and the important people in my life, including my team. I went to Afghanistan with my faith as a central tenet of my life. My faith was definitely challenged by what I saw, what I did, and what I was responsible for in Afghanistan. I know without a doubt that I never would have been able to withstand the intense pressure of leading this deployment had it not been for my faith to guide me. My team and I built a special bond. We worked weeks, months, years, working long, hard hours to build max power. And then we risked our lives to use it in Afghanistan. On each mission, I would trust them, and they would trust me with their lives. If any of us messed up, we were probably going to die. That bond with them continues today. They, my family, and the important people in my life continue to support me. Without them, 
I would probably be lost in the pain of my past. We developed this technology to combat IEDs, and then we risked our lives to use it in Afghanistan. It was a tremendous sacrifice. Now, most of you have probably seen images like this before, US forces coming home from deployment. But these aren't just random people pictured here. Each one of these soldiers and Marines followed my team and I through the most IED-intense places in Afghanistan, and each of them made it home to see their families. That is why we risked so much. And that is why what we do here at AFRL is so important. We are developing the technologies to keep these kids alive. We are developing the technologies that will allow our great nation to continue to win its battles in the future. Now, most of you will never see the impact of the technologies you work on played out on the battlefield. Don't ever forget there are airmen, soldiers, Marines, and sailors, depending on you, to deliver those technologies to them when they need them most. Thank you.